there today. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of James. Just two or three verses I want to read to you, and then we'll, we'll let you sit down. You need a blessing just to be able to stand. Amen. The book of James, all this red, white, and blue up here. We went to the Twins game yesterday. What a great game. We won. They sang the national anthem there. I think, we, I think we did it better here. I think Johnson did it better. It was great. James 4, verses, uh, let's read just two verses, 6 and 7. It says, but he gives more grace. Everybody say more grace. He gives more grace. That's why the scripture says God opposes the proud. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Favor to the humble. And it says, submit yourself to God. Everybody say Submit. Submit yourself to God and resist the devil. Everybody say resist the devil. And he will flee from you. So submit and resist. Submit and resist. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Healing's in your humility. You've heard me say it many times. Healing's in your humility. In most areas of your life where you have pain, you might have pride. Because God resists the proud. He resists the proud. Come on. You with me this morning? He resists the proud. Y'all hungry? Y'all want something? Are y'all ready for the word? Yeah. Ain't nothing, world, nothing worse in the world than cooking for people who don't want nothing to eat. I want you to get mashed potatoes on your lips and gravy on your ears. and You eat like that, I'll cook all day. Come on, amen? amen. Lord, I thank you for the word. Let it, let it be... Let it, let it be life-changing today. Let, let something that's said literally change us from the inside out. And, and Lord, I, I'm going to preach publicly. There's people watching online across the nation. There's our Fridley campus that's watching. But Lord, I need you to walk up and down every row at Fridley and here and those watching online. And I, I need you to, to preach a private sermon that, that changes our heart today. That we would learn to walk in freedom. For he whom the Son is set free is free indeed. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Come on, give him praise one more time all over the house. You can be seated. Let's go to work. So let me, let me start off by saying that the spirit world is real. And uh, the spirit world is literally the parental world from which everything in the physical world evolves. Everything comes from the invisible to the visible. The Bible says that, that God is the God of the visible and the invisible world, that you literally came from the invisible to the visible. That the Bible says that before you were formed in your mother's womb, that God knew you. Well, where did he know you? He knew you in the invisible world. He knew you and ordained you that you would be a prophet to the nations. Come on, amen about that. And uh, everything, the, the, the clothes that you're wearing, the car you drove here, the chair you're sitting in, somebody thought about it, somebody made it on paper, and then they made it out of some other material, and then they made it out of cotton, and you're wearing it today. It came from the invisible to the that there are two worlds coexisting at the same time, and God is the God of both of them. Can I get an amen? amen? And the spirit world is real, and people, you know, even in church, sometimes we want to be so fancy and act like the, the devil's not real and demons are not real, and, and you know, but, but the Bible is true, and it tells us that the spiritual world is real, that there is a demonic world, that there are evil spirits, that they are real. And uh, there is a, uh, a demonic spirit at work in the kingdom of Satan. And, and really, when you look at it, there are three different categories that the enemy attacks you and three purposes behind every demonic and evil spirit that comes against your life. Uh, and I'm going to give them to you today. I want you to take notes on this uh, because I want you to arm yourself with the word of God because I refuse to pastor an ignorant church. Can I get an amen? And so I want you to know uh, how the enemy comes against you. See, the enemy comes against you with thought. He comes against you with method. 
that you cannot divorce your mind from your worship, that you cannot become so anointed that you have no intelligence. Listen at this word. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of of God. How many of you have heard that verse before, that passage? So when the enemy comes against you, he comes against what you know about God. Now, if you don't have any knowledge, he don't have much to come against. But if you do have knowledge, he'll either try to dilute or pollute what you know about God. That's why in Genesis, when Satan came to Eve, he gave her a word test to see where she was. He says, as God said unto you, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. She says, I'm bad. I've been to creative church. I know what God has said. He goes, okay, I'm going to have to go a different way to get you. So he questioned her. He gave her a word test to see where where she was because he's going to come against to dilute or pollute what you know about God. So there are three different spirits that come against you to attack you. The first one, if you're taking notes, write it down, are tormenting spirits. Tormenting spirits. They have to do with mental anguish. They, They attack your mind. How many of you, like me, have ever been attacked, come on, by tormenting spirits? Anybody? These are tormenting spirits. They attack your mind and they rob you of peace. They rob you of peace. When a tormenting spirit begins to make an inroad into a person's life, it starts off as a mental battle. It becomes a mental battle. It becomes a mental fight just to keep going. And uh, I'm not talking about, you know, um, just normal discouragement, but there are real spirits that torment people. For example, the Bible calls it uh, in 2 Timothy 1.7, it says that God has not given us the spirit of fear. How many of you have ever been fearful and you're fearful and you don't even have a reason to be fearful? You're just fearful. Fear, come on. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody's ever been really fearful? You know, I mean, seriously, fearful. I mean, it takes the wet out of water. It takes the breeze out of wind. Like, you just become numb, right? I'm not talking about you drink milk after the expiration date. I'm, I mean, which can be fearful. I don't know how that's the, the date. The cows tip them off or something, but it's terrifying to drink it after that date. But I'm talking about real fear that attacks you, and God has not given us the spirit of fear, There's a spirit that can attack you, that can torment you. The spirit of fear is a tormenting spirit, and it hinders you. They're called hindering spirits. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, write it down. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 9. Paul talks about how the spirit uh, came against him greatly, that Satan had sent a messenger to attack him, to torment him, to torment. Satan literally sent a demonic spirit to torment the apostle Paul and he prayed about it three times. Three times he asked the Lord, take this away from me, deliver me from this spirit. Three times, look at him, verse eight, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Verse nine, but he said unto me, my grace, everybody say my grace, my grace is sufficient for you and my power is made perfect in your weakness, always opposing you, always coming against you to discourage you, to defeat you, to mentally oppress you. Acts chapter 10, verse 38, it says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. How many of you know you need the Holy Ghost? And that's what gives you the power is the Holy Spirit. And he went about doing good and healing. Look at what what Jesus was healing. Healing all those who were oppressed oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. The word oppressed means to be mentally heavy, to be mentally attacked, to be defeated, to be beat down. That many of the miracles that Jesus did in setting people free was in their mental health. Woo, somebody else say amen about it. That Jesus was going around healing people who were oppressed by the enemy. So there are tormenting spirits and their objective is to hinder you. They seek to hinder the child of God from doing what God has called them to do. People who God brought you into the house and we're like, hey, get involved. And you're like, well, no, I don't want to get involved. And, and it's like, well, I got this going on. I'm being hindered by this. I'm being fought like that. And, and literally hinders them 
We can tell. They're like, well, I just, you know, this and that and the other and all this stuff, or I'm scared, or, you know, this might happen or that. And, and they're literally hindered from doing what God has called them to do. And this is why the apostle Paul said he faced it over and over and over again. But you have to understand that spirits and principalities, how I many of you know we don't fight people? That we fight spirits. Come on. That the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, evil spirits, wickedness in high places. That the fight is not a person. And you have to understand that spirits and personalities, I'm sorry, spirits and principalities work through personalities. That person on your job, the personality. Woo, you can't say amen, say ouch. The enemy works through people. Spirits and principalities work through personalities. Because as a spirit, you have to have a body. Spirits cannot function without a physical body or a person to work through. Satan works through people. That's why you want to give the problem a name. You want to make it about a person, but it's not a person. It's a spirit. And they seek to find people to work through or work their assignment through. And so Satan didn't just come into the garden in Genesis and start as a spirit talking to Eve. He found a serpent that he had to work through. He had to take a physical body and he had to work through it. So he took on this serpent, possessed the serpent and began to deal with Eve. You remember when Jesus uh, dealt with the man in the tombs of Gadarenes and he was possessed by legions of demons? And Jesus said, what is your name? And the demon said, legions. And they asked Jesus not to send them uh, to judgment, but to let them go into the pigs. Come on, anybody know this Bible story? Because it was, it's illegal for you to be on the planet without a body. They have, they, have to, they have to be in some kind of physical body in order to be here. So Satan didn't just come into the garden. He worked through the serpent and, and, and because he's a spirit. He's not born of earth. And God gave him dominion uh, to be here, uh, but, but he is a spirit being. But God gave dominion over earth to earth-born creatures. And so when you come into the garden, he can't just come in there as a spirit. He has to be in a body. Same thing when God. When God came to earth, he had to be in a body. Because God is a spirit. And those that worship him must worship him in and in truth. So just as much as Satan cannot be here without a body, God cannot transgress his word according to John 4. He cannot transgress his word. And so he had to come through a body and that body was Jesus. So Mary supplied the body, but our heavenly father supplied the blood. Come on, somebody say amen about that. Same thing in, in biology. The woman supplies the egg, but the blood of the baby comes through the sperm. We had to have spotless blood that could wash away our sins. Somebody say amen about that. Don't make me explain to you what a woman is and a man is because our world can't seem to explain it. I can't explain it. And you ain't got to go very far in Genesis to explain it. And when Jesus shows up, it is God literally coming through a virgin and he receives his body from Mary, his blood from his heavenly father. That's why the Bible says, for unto us a child is born but a son is given. That's why he's called Jesus the Christ. Christ, I said, I told you last week, Christ wasn't Jesus' last name. Christ was the spirit. Somebody say amen. And he was crucified for our sins. He died. He rose again on the third day. It's a good place to say Amen. He rose again on the third day, was taken up in a cloud, and is today sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercession, praying for you. He's your advocate. And he told the church, go and wait in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, when they were all in one accord and in one place, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled the house where they were sitting and appeared upon them cloven tongues like as of fire, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance, that was the birth of the New Testament church in Acts chapter two. 
He says, go and wait, and I'm going to literally pour my spirit out upon you, and you are going to become the body of Christ, the Holy Spirit is going, my spirit is going to go in you because Christ's spirit has to be in a body. And because the body of Jesus is where? In heaven, at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you, the spirit of Christ, if it's gonna be on earth, it's gotta be in a body. So guess what you are? The body of Christ. That's why you're never called the body of Jesus. Because Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. But you are the body of, that's why the Bible says Christ in you, the hope of glory. We are the body of Christ. We are literally the hands and the feet of Christ. You are the voice of Christ. You are an ambassador of the kingdom of God. That when people see you, they should see Christ. When they meet you, they should meet Christ. When you talk, it should be as if Christ was speaking to me. So why do you wanna be known by all these other things? Why do you want your identity in all these other things rather than Christ? Why do you want people to know all these other things about you before they would know Christ is in you? Oh, Jesus. Because we live in a world that's made an idol out of your political party. We live in a nation that's made an idol out of your ethnicity. We live in a nation that tells you make an idol out of your skin tone, make an idol out of your political party, make an idol out of, out of all these other things except Christ. But let me tell you something. Making people fall in love with your skin tone won't save anybody from hell. Making people fall in love with your political party won't save anybody from hell. And you keep lifting up your skin tone. You keep lifting up your ethnicity. You keep lifting up, well, I'm a man, I'm a woman. You keep lifting up all these other things. Well, I'm Republican, I'm Democrat, I'm independent. None of those things are gonna save people. That's why Jesus said, I have to be lifted up. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto Unto me. Your identity has to first be in Christ. In Christ. On Christ the solid rock, all other ground. There you go. Some of y'all went to Sunday school. (laughs) And it's true. And one day Jesus is coming back to rapture his church. And he's going to resurrect his body, which is the church. And the church, the body of Christ, is going to be caught up in the air in the rapture to meet Jesus in the air. How many of you want to meet Jesus in the air one day? Come on, you believe in the rapture. And instantly, as soon as that happens, instantly someone called the Antichrist will come on the scene and this world will be in chaos. And if you think we're in turmoil and confusion now, you ain't seen nothing yet, baby. Wait till millions and millions of blood-washed, sanctified, Holy Ghost-filled people mysteriously vanish. And, uh, and, and there is chaos and airplanes falling out the sky and people will be missing and I will not be here. You can be the pastor, you can have it all, you can do whatever you want to do. Say whatever you want to say, I'll be gone, baby. Come on, anybody else going with me? I'm leaving on the first ship. And, and, and this world is going to go into chaos like you've never seen, the Bible says. And all of a sudden, there'll be a peacemaker that will arrive onto the scene, and, and he will be the Antichrist. And for three and a half years, they will have prosperity like the world has never seen. He will have all the answers. He will bring peace on the earth. And I'm going through this very fast. But then the Bible says that he will, he will be mortally wounded. He'll be mortally wounded in the head. And he will pretty much basically die. And then he will uh, resurrect. And when he comes back, he'll literally be possessed by the spirit of Antichrist in the last three and a half years of the tribulation will be, he will be a completely different person. And he suddenly turns on the nation of Israel and 
they establish the mark of the beast and no one will be able to buy or sell. What we just went through with COVID and the vaccine, I'm telling you, it was just a precursor for what is coming down the pike. It was just, it was just a test trial, a test run for what is in store for the world. Forget America. I'm talking about the world. You saw it on a world stage. Come on, am I right about it? And, 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 and what is to happen? And Satan will possess this body and the Antichrist will literally be a man completely possessed by Lucifer himself. But the body of Christ is coming back. Amen. And uh, after seven years, three and a half, the first tribulation, three and a half, the back end of the tribulation, after seven years, uh, Jesus, our king, is coming back on a white horse, the Bible says, with a vesture dipped in blood. He's wearing blood as an accessory. Anytime you wear blood as an accessory, you're bad, dude. I mean, you're not, it's like, some guys have a problem following Jesus because he just, every time you see like somebody made some picture of him, he just looks effeminate and his hair is like feathered and he's got like a glow, like he works at a nuclear power plant and, and you're like, I don't know if I can follow that guy, you know, but I'm telling you, when he comes back next time, they won't be beating on him next time. They won't be whipping on him next time. He's coming back wearing blood as an accessory on a white horse with all of us. And he's got a tattoo on his thigh that says King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he's going to establish this earth. And the Bible says we will rule and reign with him for a thousand years. Somebody say amen about that. For a thousand years. Some of you are like, where, where, what is he talking about? This is in your Bible. And that's why I'm saying to you, spirits are very real and they have to have a body. They have to have a body. And there, there are tormenting spirits, the Bible says. Write that one down, tormenting spirits. They come to hinder you. The apostle Paul was speaking about it. And he said, they come to hinder me, that, that he's come against me. Satan has come against me to hinder me. And everywhere that he went, it was battle after battle. Even it, it, Satan even came against Jesus. Jesus said, the enemy of this world has come against me to hinder me. But look what Jesus said. But Jesus said, but finding nothing in me. See, nobody can pull out of you what's not in you. If you freak out, fly off the handle, curse, all that, that's because that's in you. How many people remember when we was little kids? So I'm 42. So when I had remote control car, we didn't, it wasn't truly remote at first. You had a cord from the remote to the car. Anybody remember that? You, and you had to follow. You can only go as far as the cord was. But then they came out where it was remote control truly, and you could be way back off the car and hit the remote, and the car would move. But like little, little boys, we wasn't okay just to have it. We had to find out what was up underneath of the hood and mess it up and all that kind of stuff. And so we figured that that little receiver under there seemed like a good thing to hack off, and so we're not happy until we have hacked it off, and then we get the remote, and the car doesn't move. And the reason the car don't move now is because the remote has nothing in the car. So Jesus said, the enemy of this world has come against me to try me, but finding nothing in me. He couldn't do nothing with me because there was no, there was no sin, no darkness, no evil in him at all. Come on, amen about it. That's why you got to go to God and say, God, if there be anything in me, because some of you, all Satan has to do is hit the remote. And the reason you fly off is because it's in you. That's why you got to go to God and say, God, if there be anything in me, purify me. Come on, say that with me. Say, Jesus, purify me. Come on, say, wash me. Take it out of me so that Satan would have nothing in me. And Paul prayed three times for God to remove it and, and remove the hindrance, and he wouldn't do it. God said, my grace is sufficient for you. Let me tell you what the grace of God is. It's like in Acts 19. There were assassins that were literally coming to kill Paul, and Paul escaped out the back of the house in a basket while they came in the front door trying to kill him. That's the grace of God. The grace of God is that it's not that you don't go through anything. It's that you will survive what you go through. Come on. The Bible says there is now no temptation overtaking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful that he will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape. So every time you go through something, God says, I'll find a way of escape for you. That, not that you won't go through it, but that you'll be able to bear it, that you'll be able to survive it. 
that Paul was stoned to death. Paul was stoned. And when they got through sto throwing stones on him and they thought they had killed him, they walked away and left. And then, then God just resurrected Paul. He gets up out of the stones, knocks it off. He's bleeding, busted. He just got stoned to death. And God says, I'm not through with you. So he brings him back and says, keep going. I'm telling you, no weapon formed again. It doesn't say the weapon won't be formed. It says it won't prosper. Oh my God, that's a good place to shout. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. He goes down the road and keeps on preaching. Paul went through hard times. Paul went through a storm. Anybody else went through a storm? Going through a storm now. Paul went through a storm. The whole ship was shipwrecked. It fell apart on pieces and he made it on a plank and a prayer. Some of you are literally making it on a plank and a prayer, but he made it. He's trying to do what God's called him to do. He, he's stoned. Well, he has to run from assassins. Then he's stoned. Then he's shipwrecked. And as soon as he gets from the shipwreck, he's shivering. He's freezing cold. He reaches down to the fire to grab a stick to warm himself. And a snake jumps out and bites him. Anybody gone through anything like this? It's like it's one thing after the next, after the next, after the next. After. That's, what, that's, what the, that's a spirit that has come against you to hinder you. To get you to just to say, I give up. I give up. I quit. I'm done. I'm through with this marriage. I'm through with this job. I'm through with ministry. I'm through with this church. I'm through with these kids. I'm through. It, it, is a, it is a spirit that has come against you to hinder you, to get you to give up, to get you to quit. And you keep praying prayers like, God, help me not go through anything. Help me just, just everything be easy. And God is saying, I'm not going to make it easy. My grace is sufficient for you. And my power is made perfect in your weakness. It's literally demonic spirits that come against you to hinder you, to attack you, to get you to, to, to wave the white flag and to, and to walk away from your faith, to walk away with trusting God. And you've got to realize that when you get attacked like that, it's because you're on mission. It's because you're doing what God has called you to do. That's why you're going through things. You're on assignment by God, and Satan has literally sent his demonic spirits to hinder you, to get you to give up on what God has called you to do. And if that wasn't bad, then he got put in prison. <laughs> got put in prison with Silas. How many people remember that? And at midnight, Paul and Silas began to pray and sing praises unto God. It's not that you won't go through anything. In prison, can you worship in prison? Can you worship without a job? Can you worship and you're not, you're not healthy in your body? Can you worship? Can you have the kind of faith class? I never had had a faith class like, like a woman in the hospital who couldn't lift her arm because she had had a stroke and you walk in and she's taking her good arm and grab, taking her good arm and grabbing her bad arm and lifting it to God and saying, you will worship and you will praise and you will. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like that's a faith class. When you take what you got left and say, I'm going to make it, maybe it's just a plank and a prayer. Maybe it's just one good arm. Maybe it's whatever you have left. God never does miracles through what you lost. He only does miracles through what you have left. It's not that you won't go through anything. It's not that you, you, you'll dodge the fiery furnace. You'll be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and, but he'll be the fourth man in the fire with you because you're a worshiper. He shuts the mouth of the lion. It's not that you won't go into the lion's den, but he'll shut the mouth of the lion and you'll escape it like Daniel. You go through it, tormenting spirits. And I don't know who this is for. Maybe it's not but for one person, but the Lord sent me here today to tell you that his grace is sufficient for you. And he's going to make a way to deliver you. No weapon formed against you. Say that with me. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. If you believe it, give God a praise this morning all over the house. <laughs> unclean spirits. Write this down. Unclean spirits come to bind you. They come to bind you. They want to bind you to something. 
You have tormenting spirits and you have unclean spirits. Unclean spirits come to bind you to an addiction, to alcohol, to lust, to some addiction in your life, to drug abuse. They, they want to move past the, the mind into the physical. Listen at this strategy. because I'm, I'm, I came to help some people get free. Anybody want to get free? Anybody want their kids to be free? Come on, their grandkids to be free. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to tell you how Satan works. A lot of people don't know. Satan first attacks your mind. Then he attacks your body. Physical attack. Physical addiction. Buying you to drug addiction. And then you begin to manifest in anger. Manifest in violence. When an unclean spirit begins to take over a person, it doesn't just end with the mind. It starts with the mind, but then it begins to take over them physically into violence, into murder. And lastly, there are evil spirits. Write that down. There are evil spirits. The Bible literally uses the term evil spirits. And evil spirits want to drive you. Write it down. Evil spirits want to drive you. They want to possess you. They want to control you. When you see somebody go into a mall or a school and shoot dozens of people, that person is demonically possessed. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? And I'm not, I'm not getting political, but I'm just telling you that I, my family is from a nation that's, you're not allowed a gun. You can't have a gun in the Bahamas. If you get caught with a bullet, it's five years in prison with a bullet, okay? So, and they have murders every day. Per capita, they're way higher than our nation. So what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying, I don't know what people ought to do with legislation. I don't know what ought to be done. We'll trust God. But what I'm saying is there's a spirit behind it. With guns, without guns, I'm telling you, there's a spirit behind murder. There's a spirit behind violence. I don't know what ought to be done politically. I'm not, I'm not getting into that. I'm telling you, whatever, whatever that is as it is, I'm telling you the, what's behind that is a spirit of murder and violence, and it's an evil spirit. That's what you don't hear on CNN and Fox News and MSNBC. That's what you hear in God's house, is it's a spirit of murder and violence, an evil spirit. And, and the Bible says in Timothy that in the last days, that seducing spirits, that demonic spirits will be stirred up. One of the reasons you see the violence that we see in our nation and around the world is because we are living in the last days. You can't legislate demonic spirits. Did you hear me? No political party can pass enough laws to replace the church. The church has to be the church. We have to, we have to do our part as the church. And this is exactly what we're seeing. And I didn't just come in here to curse the darkness. I came in here this morning to turn on the light. We have to point the world to Jesus. Come on, can I get an amen about it? It's time for the church to understand that we have power, the Bible says, over all demonic power, that God has given us power over all demonic spirits. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. That we can bind, that we can, that we can bind demonic spirits. And the Bible says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That we have the power to bind tormenting spirits and unclean spirits and evil spirits in the name of Jesus. And these spirits manifest through violence to kill to steal and to destroy and to murder. And people wake up and they say, I don't know what happened. I don't know 
Why I did it? I don't, I don't understand. It's like I blacked out. It's like, it's like I'd lost control. I, I lost my temper. I was out of my mind. It was a demonic spirit that took control. You ask yourself, how does the devil choose who he's going to attack? You see, I have a body, soul, and spirit. And when the enemy, a mind, you could call it, it was the soul, a mind, body, and spirit. And when the enemy wants to attack, he first looks for children. Did you hear what I said? The enemy first looks at children at a young age that he can attack, that he can somehow try to damage and create a hole in their soul. And the Bible says that we ought not be ignorant of the devil's devices. That we literally are in a world that is going after our children. We send our children to school to get an education, not to be indoctrinated with lies. Two plus two doesn't equal transgender. It equals four. You open up biology books, and in the first chapter, biology is the study of life. And in the first chapter, it talks about gender fluidity. That's not science. That's a political agenda. That's a political agenda because scientifically, men are men and women are women. Can't nobody change your DNA. You can't change your DNA. Sit there and be quiet if you want. Support it if you please. But it's a lie from the pit of hell. And if we don't speak up as a church and we don't start speaking up in our homes and speaking up in our families, that's why we started Creative Academy. We started Creative Academy because, just look at the stats, it is a statistical fact that if your kids grow up in public school and the public school system wants to indoctrinate our kids from cradle to grave, and I'm not attacking teachers because teachers are underpaid, massively underpaid. But Paul tells us, do not yoke yourself to a wicked system. Do not yoke yourself to a demonic system. You say, well, my teacher saved. Your teacher may be saved, but your teacher is also yoked to this system and can't speak up because they're paid by this system. And they may be saved, they may be filled with the Holy Ghost, but they're yoked to it. And you send your kids to, to public school, it's a statistical fact that if you send your kids to public school, when they, if you send them to a secular university, secular university, within the first year, their freshman year, 70% of them walk away from God. 70%. So you raise your kid in public school, you're sending them to secular university, there's a 70% chance they're walking away from God in their first year because it's an agenda to walk away from God. There's an, there's an all-out agenda. The government didn't start schools. Churches did. The government didn't start hospitals. Churches did. Harvard was a Bible college. What? A Bible college to teach the word of God and to teach, to teach the laws of this nation through a Christian Judeo lens. And now look at it. And we send our kids to public school and they're being indoctrinated by it. 57 million kids in this nation are in public school. 5.7 are in private school, two are in homeschool. I'm encouraging parents all over the nation to quit outsourcing education and get involved in the lives of your kids and consider homeschooling your children more than ever before. More than ever before. Well, I'm busy. Who's not busy? They're your children. Nobody's going to love your children, care for your children, and have their best interests in mind more than you. None of, nobody. And more than ever before, we've got to get involved in the lives of our children. 
We've got to rescue our children because the enemy will do everything he can to attack the youth. Talk to people. I, talk to, I, I know hundreds of people who, who struggle with LGBTQ, struggle with, I was raped, I was abused, I was molested. I don't know my identity they're trying to find because the enemy will always try to put some, he'll try to get some foothold, some hole in their soul at a young age to try to attack them, to try to discourage them, to try to put their identity in it, fatherlessness. Children all over our nation are coming up fatherlessness because it's a hole in their soul. And they become vulnerable to a lie. They become vulnerable to predators, vulnerable to drug addiction and alcohol addiction. Nobody, y'all look at me like I'm crazy. You live in this nation. You know the stats. You know exactly what I'm telling you is the truth. And he takes advantage of a, of a, of our children when we have a hole in our kid's heart. But today I came to cancel the devil's assignment over our children in the name of Jesus. I cancel Satan. I cancel his plot. I cancel his plan. I cancel his agenda. I cancel his demonic prophecies over our children. You cannot have our children, our teenagers, in the name of Jesus. We've been given the power in the name of Jesus through the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony to cancel the devil's assignment off our children. And Satan's terrified at this next generation because they're going to usher in the second coming of Jesus. They're going to be the ones that usher in the second coming of the Lord. And he does everything he can to murder millions of them through abortion, Millions of them. He does everything he can to wipe out a generation, wipe out a generation of people. And the church says nothing? How can you say nothing? If anything, we should be more vocal about saving babies and saving lives. If there's one demographic of people in our nation that don't have a voice, it's the unborn. And if there's ever been a time to speak up for them, it's now. To put our money where our mouth is. That's why we're buying this ultrasound bus to go all over the Twin Cities and provide free ultrasounds for mothers in need and save babies. Thank God for Creative Church that's come along and been a lighthouse in the Twin Cities. Come on, amen about it. And anointed by the Holy Spirit, we're called to bring change into the Twin Cities, to be a light in darkness. And people need to rise up in faith and rise up in the face of the enemy and say, you're not gonna have my kids. You're not gonna have my family. As for me and my house, we will serve The Lord, I'm not gonna let my kids be on phones and iPads and computers in their room looking at all kinds of nonsense and lies from the enemy. Looking at all kinds of demonic attack and and, and pornography. It's literally like getting a blood transfusion from hell. And many of you might be in the room this morning saying, well, my kids are going through hell right now. But I believe in the name of Jesus, they're going to overcome it and reverse the curse and cancel Satan's plot and plan against our teenagers in the name of Jesus. That's why we're doing this creative uh, truth conference for our teenagers. We're not doing it because we got nothing to do. We're doing it because we believe that God's called us to create an environment where their faith can be celebrated and not tolerated. Where they can learn truth of God, the truth of God's word. We've got to speak up against the enemy. And and go to God on our knees in prayer and pray for our children. And pray for them. See, the you uh, and hear me when I say this. It's not, the point is not to pray to find God's will. The will of God is that you pray. If you're sitting here in the room, friendly or watching me online, and you're going, I'm trying to find the will of God, and people tell you, you should go pray. Go, go ask God the will of God. You don't, you don't pray to find the will of God. The will of God is that you pray. 
Does that make sense to you? Come here, Alexander. Run up here real quick. So I've got teenagers now. So this is Alexander. He's 16. And how many of you want to have quality time with your teenagers? How many of you have teenagers? You want to have quality time with your teenagers? Okay, well, I want to have quality time with him. But I can't schedule quality time. I can schedule time. I can't schedule, I can't schedule quality, meaningful time where he opens up to me and talks to me and engage. I can't make that happen. Come on, parents who have teenagers, say amen to me. Like you, I can't schedule. I can schedule time. I can't schedule quality time. So if I want to have quality time, I just have to be around him more. And in being around him more, it's like I go, hey, you want to go for a ride in the convertible? Uh, I guess. All right, let's go. We get in the car, we're driving, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And he starts to talk to me. He starts talking to me. I can't go, oh, wait, we're having quality time. Because <laughs> it'll kill it. So if I want to have quality time with him, I just have to be around him more. And as I'm around him, he just begins to share his heart. I begin to share my heart. It just, it, it just happens. You don't know when it happens. It just happens. It's the same thing with God. If you want to know the will of God, you can't, you can't, I can't go to him and say, tell me your heart. I have to just be around him. And in being around him, I, I get his heart. He knows my heart because we're around each other. It's the same thing with God. So many people don't want to spend time with God and they just want to go to God to find his will. And that's why you don't get anywhere because God's like, no, we, we got to have a relationship here. So it's, you don't go to God in prayer to find his will. It's the will of God that you pray because prayer gets you in his world. And if you're in his world, you don't ever have to pray about it because you already know what God is saying to you. You know what God is speaking to you. So you can't just schedule quality time with God. It's just being around God that you know his heart. Come on, somebody say amen about it. He did great. I love you. Look at his face. Look at his face. They hate that. It's God's will that you spend time with him. Now, I love what this woman said. You just got to cancel it. You just got to cancel the enemy's plans. We're not victims. Come on, we're not victims. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. I love what this woman said in 2 Kings. I don't have time to talk about all of it because I'm running out of time. But, but this woman in 2 Kings, her family was in a mess. Her family was in a mess. Her son had just like died, like fallen over. Young man, like Alexander, even the field had just fallen over, dead. And, and she's like, I'm not gonna lose this boy because this boy was a miracle son. And so she gets on her horse to go find the prophet and people started asking her, hey, what's going on? What's wrong? And this, listen, this is what the Bible said. Her response was, oh my God, I love this woman. Her response was, it's well. Her family's in a mess. Her son has just collapsed. She gets on a horse to go find the prophet and people start asking her, what's going on? What's, what's, what's wrong with your family? How's, how's your son? What's happening? And she says, it's well. First thing that taught me is don't share your problems with people who can't help you. Yeah. Oh, God. And, and the second thing is just learn to speak what you believe is going to happen over your children and over your family. Come on, somebody. Somebody shout, it is well. 
you've got to begin to speak that over your family, over your children. I came to tell somebody this morning, you need to say that over your family. What's going on with Alexander? Alexander is well. Nicholas is well. Isabella, it is well. Penelope, it is well. Victoria, it is well. Liliana, it is well. Augustine, it is well. Come on, Winston, it is well. You need to declare it over your children over your marriage, over your family, over your finances. Somebody say, it is, it is well. It is well in the name of Jesus. I trust God. I believe that God is going to work it out. Shout it to demons. Shout, shout, it is well to fear. The children, the children have learning disorders. When they tell your child, your child has a learning disorder and they'll never be this, they'll never be that, say, it is well. Shout it to your marriage. You gotta learn to speak up. When the enemy opens his mouth, open yours. Don't let the enemy just trash talk you and plant fear in your heart. That's why the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Hold on, to the, I don't need no music for a minute, just wait. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Talk back. Somebody say, talk back. Talk back. Don't shut up. Don't go silent. Some of y'all are so mouthy. You're so doggone mouthy. You talk back to everybody except the enemy. You talk back. You, you, you won't shut up. You talk back to your wife, your husband. You, no wonder your kids talk back to you. You're so mouthy to everybody except Satan. And Satan talks at you, you shut up. And you submit to it. I cancel that off of you this morning in the name of Jesus. Learn to speak up. Get mouthy with Satan. Argue it. Fight back. And say, it's going to be all right. It is well. I trust God. I'm not going to be silent about this. It's well with my husband. It is well with my wife. It's well with my children. It's going to be all right. You remember that old church song, I Got a Feeling? I got a feeling. Everything's going to be all right. Whoa, I. Anybody know that old song? And you, and you, and you, we'd sing that in church for hours. And, and people were sick in their bodies singing it. People got cancer and singing it. People just got laid off and singing it because you got to learn to open your mouth and speak up for what you believe. And Satan's plans are to destruct, to kill, steal, and to destroy. And he begins to attack your mind. Listen to me. He begins to attack your spirit. It starts with your mind. And then it goes into your body. And then lastly, it ends in your spirit. Listen to what the Bible says. For the, for the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. And it says that lust, everybody say lust. lust. Listen to the threefold plan that Satan comes against you. Hear me. Just listen to me. I'm almost done. It says lust. When it is conceived, it brings forth sin. Okay? Sin when it is finished brings forth death. That's what the word says. Lust, when it is conceived, bringeth forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. The enemy comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. It starts in your mind. If you don't deal with it in your mind, it goes to your body. And, if you, and then it goes from your body to your spirit. That's how the enemy attacks you. Mind, body, and spirit. You hear me? That's how the enemy comes against you with all those, all those demonic attacks. That's how he attacks you. First in your mind, then in your, your body, and lastly goes to your spirit. But notice the plan of God. You can play some for me now, James. <laughs> notice the plan of God. The plan of God is different. The plan of God is opposite of that. The plan of God doesn't start in your mind or your body. It starts in your spirit. 
starts in your spirit. What does Romans 10, 9? It says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, your spirit, that God has risen Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. God deals with your spirit first. Not last, first. And that's why you need a service like this, that you can say yes to Jesus. And when you say yes to Jesus, the spirit of Christ comes into you. That's why the Bible says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. This is your reasonable service. After you get saved in your spirit, he begins to affect your body. Come on. That's why the Bible says, now that you're saved, present your body. Everybody say your body. Your body, a living sacrifice. Holy. Somebody say holy. I mean, you don't just sleep around. You don't just do drugs. You don't just, you don't do, uh, this book right here on the side, you know what that says right there? That don't say love Bible. That says the, the, the holy Bible. Holy. Holy means to be set apart, set aside. So when God, when God deals with you, he deals with your spirit. Then he deals with your body. Present your body, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. This is your, not exceptionable service, but your reasonable service. Reasonable. Lastly, he deals with your mind. Now that he has your spirit, he wants your body Lastly, he deals with your mind. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your It is with the mind that you serve the Lord. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. So when Satan comes against you, he comes against your mind. Then he comes against your body, and then he comes against your spirit. But Jesus deals with your spirit because that's who you really are. Then he deals with your body. And then he lastly deals with your mind. Am I helping anybody in here today? And he begins to tell you in your mind that what you did is not who you are. The Holy Spirit begins to tell you that. What you did is not who you are. You're not what you did. You are made for more than addiction. You are made for more than lust. And your spirit becomes alive in Christ. That's why the book of Ephesians says, you who were dead in the trespasses of your sins, he has he quickened and made you alive again in Christ Jesus. He makes you alive again in your body. He makes you alive again in your mind. And all of a sudden you begin to walk in freedom. In Isaiah chapter 10, tells us not to be yoked in sin. And what breaks the yoke of sin is the anointing, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And then evil spirits cannot come against. They, they, they will not be able to deal with your family, your children, your grandchildren. And if you're being attacked, let me give you, just, let me give you this before you go. I'm freeing somebody today. I came with an, a, with an assignment of the Holy Spirit on this July 3rd for you to walk in freedom. So three things you got to, well, maybe four, but at least three things you got to do. I promise you, I'll have you out here in two minutes. First thing you got to do, if you're being attacked in your kids, your, your grandkids, your family, first thing you got to do is trace it. You got to trace that demonic attack. Trace it. What do you mean? Jesus said, put an ax to the root. Find where the enemy found an emotional hole in your family, in your child, and cover it with the blood of Jesus. That's why Jesus, Jesus did this. Jesus, you watch Jesus minister to people, he asked them questions. How long, how long have you been like this? Your, your teenage son that's, that's de de demonic possessed, he asked the dad, how long has he been like this? He'd ask people who are possessed by demons, what's your name? What's your name? What's he doing? He's trying to trace it. He's trying to find the, the, the foothold. What, what was the entry point that Satan came in? Am I helping somebody? I feel like I, feel like, I literally feel like I'm freeing somebody. 
You got to trace it. Trace it. That's what Jesus did. Jesus asked questions. See, say, all Satan needs is a, is a, a foothold, a toehold. It's like, you remember when the allies came together to destroy Hitler and they went on the beaches of Normandy? You remember the beaches of Normandy? And all of Europe was taken over by Hitler and we came in, what they called it was a toehold, one beach. Because we knew if we could just get one point, one entry point, we could, we could destroy him. And we were willing to, to, to sacrifice thousands of men to have that foothold. Because if we can get in there, we can get in. That's what Satan does. Satan looks for one point, one small point, if I can just find one entry into their life. So you got to trace it. You got to trace it. And the last thing, or the next thing after you, you trace it, you've got to face it. Everybody say face it. You got to face it. Just be honest. Be humble. Confess, I'm struggling with this. I have a problem. I have this issue. Just be honest. Come on, just everybody say that. Say be honest. Just be honest with you. God already knows. God's not intimidated by it. Just be honest about it. I have this issue. You got to face it. Because his grace is sufficient for you. I need, I need God's help. I have to face this issue. I got my marriage is bad. Face it. We don't pray together. Face it. Don't, don't sugarcoat it. Face it. People come in, they want to meet with me about their marriage. I say, you pray together? Well, you know, face it. No, we don't. Face it. I got this issue. It's bad. My marriage, my, my life, I've got this issue. Face it. Be honest. You trace it. You face it. Then you erase it. Everybody say you erase it. Erase it. Through the blood of Jesus, he cleanses you from all unrighteousness. You erase it. You erase it. Everybody say erase it. Through the blood of Jesus and forgiveness. Everybody say forgiveness. You can't move forward without forgiveness. You cannot move forward and you still hate your father because he left you when you were eight years old. You cannot erase it and you're still bitter at that last church. You can't erase it and you're still mad at your ex-husband. You have to erase it. You have to forgive. You trace it, you face it, you erase it. And lastly, you replace it. You replace it. You replace an evil spirit by having the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, when an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes through dry places. And that evil spirit will go out to find someone else to go into. And if it can't find someone else to go into, it will come back. Jesus said this, read it. Jesus said, that spirit will come back to that man. And if it finds that man empty, that same spirit will go and get seven other spirits, more wicked, and all of them will come and occupy that man. And the last days of that man will be worse than the beginning. That's why it's not enough just for you to say, I'm forgiven of my sins. You need to get filled with the Holy Ghost. You've got to replace that evil spirit with the Holy Spirit. Somebody say amen about that. I need the Holy Spirit living in me. The Holy Spirit. This is a sermon on freedom today. So James 4, 7 says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will, you have to submit. Everybody say submit. And then you resist. Submit and resist. Submit and resist. And let the Holy Spirit deal with your spirit today, your body, and then your mind. So you can walk in freedom. Because he whom the Son has set free... You get some out of this today? Come on, on this July 3rd.